Tonight, Republicans voted to repeal President Obama's health reform law. Ultimately, as Senate Majority Leader Harry, Harry Reid put it, this is a gesture in futility. The GOP's repeal efforts will go nowhere beyond the House, as the Senate's unlikely to even take up the measure, and the President will obviously not sign off on a repeal of his signature victory from last year. So why are they doing it? After all, the American people are not in favor of repeal. According to a new Washington Post ABC News poll, only 18% of Americans support the GOP's efforts in completely repealing health reform. 18%. And take a look at what people think repeal will do to the economy. 54% think repeal will hurt the economy. A plurality, 46% think it'll cut jobs. And 62% think it'll increase the deficit. The truth is, all of these respondents are exactly right. And in the wake of this repeal effort, many Republican lawmakers are facing tough questions regarding their own health insurance. Take a look. Feel Obamacare when it comes up for vote? Absolutely. Do hey, you think you'll also be uh, wanted to get into that room rejecting government-sponsored health care for yourself? I will not. What, what the Republican plan has always been is to have uh, health care reform that looks more like the federal employee benefit plan. But the federal not employee like benefit a, plan, isn't that sponsored not like by the government? A, oh, no. He's, nobody, uh, isn't it taxpayer subsidized? <laughs> uh, so is my salary. Do you think it's hypocritical to take uh, government uh, subsidized and regulated health care as a member of Congress, but repeal it for everyone else? Okay. Yeah. So let's assume for a moment that Republicans are successful in, appealing, in repealing Obamacare. What happens then? This is, this is pretty straightforward stuff. I mean, the effects of this repeal are right here to be seen. Job killing health reform law repeal. There will be four million fewer jobs by 2019. This is a, a pretty consensus perspective, by the way, from a whole variety of economists, the, the Office of Management and Budget, the White House. More uninsured people, 32 million people, will be dropped from the insurance rolls. More debt, it'll add $230 billion to the debt, if the Republicans are able to do this. But the fact of the matter is that the Republicans aren't going to be able to do this, first of all. And secondly, there's a larger issue here. There's a whole other issue here. There's, there's this notion that is being peddled by, by and large, the Republican Party and others on the right that the United States is somehow completely different, that Americans are completely different from everybody else in the world. The, this, this, the American exceptionalism notion, you know, yes, America was founded in, in an idea and an ideal that is arguably unique in the world, and, and that's a really important thing to know and to continue to talk about. But the idea that every other developed country in the world has full national health care systems, and we shouldn't because we're somehow exceptional, or different, it's really, it's a, it's a phony, phony notion. It doesn't work. T.R. Reid did this uh, health care as a uh, health care uh, documentary for PBS. And in, in this documentary, he pointed out, in the, actually in the original edition, he pointed out that every other developed country in the world not only has health care for all of their citizens, and not only considers health care a right, but also makes it illegal for for-profit companies to be offering health insurance, primary health insurance. When the Corporation for Public Broadcasting stripped that out of his documentary, he asked that his name be taken off as the producer of this incredible piece of work that he did, and they aired it without his name. I mean, that's, this, is, this is how strange this whole debate is in the United States. So why why is the right doing this? Why are they saying that they even care about this? What's the, what's the subtext to the subtext? First of all, we've got, here's an example. This is, this is the setup. This is Congressman Steve King, the Republican from, from Iowa. This is what he has to say about why and how this is wrong, health care. There have always been and likely always be babies that were born, lived, and died within the jurisdictions of the individual states who never cross a state line, access no health care, and therefore do not impact interstate commerce, 
Therefore, to compel, compel someone who fits that category to buy an insurance policy cannot be yep. defined as it is within the confines of the Interstate Commerce Clause. And Mr. Hastings didn't answer that. He devolved into policy and politics, but not the Constitution. Well, my challenge to you, Mr. No Hastings, you find that, you find that maybe, why you, find, you find that upheld. human being that has never accessed health care. And I will revise Sorry, my I'm opinion. only simplex. Can I? Uh, every human being in this country uh, has access to health care, even those who have religious objections to certain kinds of health care still access uh, health care. It is uh, impossible uh, to, to live without access to health care. Uh, uh, it country. happens all the time. Uh, what's that? It happens all the time. It happens all It's happened forever in this country and in every country in the well, world. You find the baby that was not born to a uh, at a hospital or with a midwife uh, who did not receive inoculations. You find that baby and identify them and I'll be happy to, to have that I hate that to tell discussion. you, but they show up in garbage cans around this country, sir. Now, you know, all of the, the inflammatory later stuff set aside, the, the real point there was when Steve King said, this is not covered by the Commerce Clause. Back in 1954, Brown versus Board of Education, the U.S. Supreme Court reversed its own decision from the late 1890s, 1898, I believe, um, uh, was, was Plessy versus Ferguson, where they said, separate but equals wrong. And the individual states, first of all, were saying, well, our local schools don't engage in interstate commerce. And so the Commerce Clause, you know, there, there is no basis for the federal government to come in and, and force us to integrate our schools. And similarly, the, 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 the chain stores and the, and the uh, restaurants and whatnot in the South with the whites only sign on the door were saying, you can't force us to integrate. You have no federal authority. And, and in fact, this debate even got carried into the presidential debate in 1960. Here's what Richard Nixon had to say when he was asked, and notice that Nixon is never going to actually answer the question. When he was asked, should there be a federal role in forbidding companies, companies, corporations, from discriminating against people at lunch counters? Richard Nixon. I have talked to Negro mothers. I've heard them explain, try to explain how they tell their children how they can go into a store and buy a loaf of bread, but then can't go into that store and sit at the counter and get a Coca-Cola. This is wrong, and we have to do something about it. So under the circumstances, what do we do? Well, what we do is what the Attorney General of the United States did under the direction of the President. Call in the owners of chain stores and get them to take action. So Richard Nixon, I mean, this was the conservative thing, is if you want to stop a social ill, you beg the, the captains of industry to do it. Now, Kennedy had a completely different take. He said, he, you know, he was talking about all these federal, Title III, all these federal programs that, that well, here, I'll let Jack Kennedy tell you. Here, here he is in the debate. Mr. Nixon hasn't discussed the two basic questions. What is going to be done and what will be his policy on implementing the Supreme Court decision of 1954? Giving aid to schools technically that are trying to carry out the decision is not the great question. Secondly, what's he going to do to provide fair employment? He's been the head of the Committee on Government Contracts. It's carried out two cases, both in the District of Columbia. He has not indicated his support of an attempt to provide fair employment practices around the country so that everyone can get a job regardless of their race or color. Nor has he indicated that he will support Title III which would give the Attorney General additional powers to protect constitutional rights. These are the great questions. Equality of education in schools. About 2% of our population of white people is a 10% of our colored population. 60 to 70% of our colored children do not finish high school. These are the questions in these areas that the North and the South, East and West are entitled to know. What will be the leadership of the President in these areas to provide equality of opportunity for employment? Equality of opportunity in the field of housing which could be done on all federal supported housing by a stroke of the president's pen. What would be done to provide equality of education in all sections of the United States? Those are the questions to which the president must establish a moral tone and moral leadership. And I can assure you that if I'm elected president, we will do so. That was a turning point in American history. Not just that debate, but the presidency of John Kennedy. When you heard Steve King earlier say there's no place in the Commerce Clause for this, the federal constitution, you know, the Tea Party folks and all these guys who are going off on these rants about there's no, there's no right to health care in the constitution, there isn't. The Commerce Clause, however, says that the federal government can insert itself into the activities of business of the states, that, that the, the federal government has, or the Congress has, 
the right to regulate economic activity among and between the various states. That's the Commerce Clause. So what happened in the 60s was Kennedy and then Johnson said, you know, that diner in Mississippi where they, where they got the whites only sign out front, maybe they say they're not engaging in interstate commerce, but they're serving ketchup that was made by Heinz in Pennsylvania. They're serving mustard that came from California. They're serving tomatoes that were grown in New Mexico. And so they are engaged in interstate commerce, and so we can bring the federal government in and do something. This was fought by Lester Maddox, it was fought by George Wallace, all of these southern governors said, no, you can't do it, and, but, it but they prevailed. Kennedy and Johnson prevailed. And that became the law of the land, and, that became, and the Supreme Court agreed. And that's the way it is now. So when these guys are saying, you know, it's not constitutional, what they're completely missing is the exact same, first of all, they're making the same argument. I mean, if you were to go back to the logic of these guys, then we should resegregate, or we should allow the South to completely resegregate, which they would like to do. But secondly, Every hospital, every doctor's office has things that are made in other states. Interstate commerce is involved in all of this. Now, one of the cool things about Obamacare, as much as I would have preferred a single-payer system or, or you know, even a public option, one of the cool things about it is that it allowed the states, which is really kind of ironic because we're back to saying, okay, let's talk about states' rights. It allowed the states to opt out of the program if they could figure out another way to insure all their people. Massachusetts has probably already opted out. You know, they've, they've already done this. Now, Connecticut is talking about a single-payer plan, or excuse me, about a public option, putting a public option in. Vermont is talking about having a single-payer system. The governor, the newly elected governor of Vermont, Peter Shumlin, just, just in his state of the, in his, uh, excuse me, his inaugural address, said health care is going to be a right here in Vermont. So in this weird kind of irony, this arc of history, of states' rights back to states' rights, we may see what emerge in the United States happen in Canada when Saskatchewan said in Canada, we're going to have a single-payer health care system in our state, in our province. And it worked so well that all across Canada, the other provinces were saying, you know, I like that. I want to do the same thing. And now Canada has a national health care system. It could be beginning here sooner than any of us think.